Robots are everywhere, so on the street, delivering post, working in industry, even exploring space. But now experts are developing small, versatile robots that can be used in the operating theatre, allowing surgeons to perform ever more complex tasks. Dr Christos Bergeles from King's College London is carrying out research into image-guided microsurgical robots. So image-guided microsurgical robotics relates to using image information either from microscopy or from magnetic resonance imaging or ultrasound to augment what the surgeon is seeing, make it more magnified, uh, see things under the surface and then use robots that are really good at uh, increasing the dexterity of the surgeon. Robots are there to, to assist the human operator, to assist the surgeons to do tasks that you can't do like deliver regenerative therapies in the eye in structures that are as thin as the human hair, uh, or you could have surgery without the knife, where you have a robotic system moving around your head and directing a proton beam in your brain so that it could zap tumors. So robots can give the surgeon the dexterity to manipulate those very tiny structures that microsurgery requires. Robots are already used in some surgeries, but they have enormous potential for future development. Medicine is benefiting from robotics technology right now, predominantly the domain of laparoscopy, which entails incisions on the abdomen to reach within the belly. Neurosurgery is another domain. Of course, you want to bypass the sensitive structures of the brain. Vitroretinal surgery is another one. You have very tiny structures and then you need a robot to go in. And then, of course, we will start seeing them in, in, in other disciplines that don't have to do with surgery. Rehabilitation is one, a big one. You could have a robotic arm that helps you do motion but what we are interested in an academic setting is to create robotic systems that allow interventions that are currently not possible. So go beyond the human capabilities and, and this I think will unleash a whole world of opportunities um, and then we see where it takes us. Christos and his team have been working in close collaboration with surgeons at Moorfield Eye Hospital in London to construct prototype machines which they are testing in their lab. We've recently developed new techniques, things such as gene therapy or cell therapy, where we have to do types of surgery that are beyond current human capabilities. And what we've realized is that engineers have been working on imaging and robotics, which allow those things to happen. The reality is that it's come at the same time as a revolution in biology, where we need to deliver single cells or gene therapy. And these types of treatments are at a very tiny level. We can see things that couldn't be seen before, and a robot can do finer movements, it's more precise, uh, and therefore it can do things which can't be done before. What skills and qualifications do you need to get into the field of medical robotics? I think that robotics can be an umbrella where a lot of disciplines can converge. So fundamentally these are mechanical systems, so somebody who likes designing, uh, drawing, sketching, building, uh, that's like a mechanical engineering concept, this is fundamental in what we're doing. Of course then we need to make these robots do something, and in order to make them do something you need to understand how they're supposed to work. And this is where maths and physics comes in, and where materials come in, like how do we build them, what are the appropriate materials, how do they behave, and then we need to program them. Um, software engineering, people that like to program computers or to, you know, program video games or program graphics, they definitely can have a, a career within robotics because this is how we make the systems operate. So in the past, you predominantly needed to have a university degree because this was a, a, an academically confined topic. But right now, because robots are entering our society, they are being manufactured, there are companies that, uh, you know, they would like apprentices to come in and understand how to develop this technology. Uh, and so you can have a more direct route where you get exposure to these elements through internships, through apprenticeships, and there are lots of companies in the UK and abroad that, you know, would be willing to take students that have the passion to understand how robots work. I would encourage any young person to enter the field of robotics because it's such a fantastic field and has such a breadth of applications. For me it's medicine but you can see a robot working in probably every field of human endeavour and some that I haven't even thought of and no one's thought of. So the future is enormous in robotics uh, and it's certainly exciting. 
Can you envisage a future in which robotics becomes a key part of every surgeon's training? Definitely. I think, I think that future is already here. There are many disciplines that employ robots on a very regular basis, like in laparoscopic surgery, which entails the insufflation of the abdomen. This robotic surgery is fairly common there in the UK and, and worldwide as well. And does the surgeon have to be in the room with the patient and the robots at the moment? Uh, uh, this is a very interesting question. Surgical robotics started as a, as a way to take the surgeon away from the patient. And it was originally imagined that you would have the robot operating the battlefield and then the surgeon would be sitting somewhere where they would be safe. And then there would be like a telecommunication between the two that would enable the robot to operate uh, uh, by the surgeon remotely. And the only potential problem is not the robot itself, it's the communications, that's what worries people. So I think if, if such a technology is to be rolled out, we would have made sure as engineers, as, as regulators, that uh, communication will not be disrupted. Uh, and perhaps this is where autonomy comes in. So maybe the surgeon, the robot can infer from what has been happening, how to complete an action. And are these robots already at the level where they exceed the capabilities of a human surgeon? So robots exceed the capabilities of the surgeons because they grant them something that they cannot do right now. For example, they give them superhuman capabilities in the sense that they are now, it's as if we shrink them and we place them inside the human body. Okay, it's interesting because it sounds almost scary, doesn't it? If, if you said to someone, you are going to, let's say it's eye surgery, your eye is going to be operated on by a robot. That sounds almost, it's almost frightening. Uh, correct. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, uh, we need to, to wrap our heads around that. And I think the best way to, to approach this is to, to understand, well, the ultimate control is always by the clinical team. So one way or the other, it's a tool that goes inside your body, be that the eye or the brain or the abdomen, and somebody is controlling that tool. Could you imagine a future, and maybe it's decades away, where it's not only the, uh, the, the, the physical characteristics of the robot that exceed human capabilities, but the mental characteristics. Could you imagine taking the surgeon away completely? Fantastic uh, a question, especially the mental characteristic is, I think it's the next frontier. I think it will be very, very synergistic for, uh, for many decades, but ultimately we could reach autonomy. Well, thank you, Christos, that was fascinating. Uh, thank you for having me.